Thank you. And uh, thanks, Dad, for the, for the great introduction. Uh, since becoming a father several years ago, I've become more fully appreciative of the role of mothers and fathers in life. And thank both my parents for being such great examples and teachers to me. Dad, thank you very much, and Mom, too. Ironically, it was my mom that kicked off my football career with a bang as she charged the field when I was eight years old. She was upset that another kid had neck tackled me and knocked the wind out of me, so she knew that neck tackling was illegal, and since no penalty was called, she felt an imperative to rush the field and help her little boy. I was scared to death as I saw her sprinting across the field with good speed, I might add, assuming she was coming to give me a kiss or something. Imagine the visual, late 1960s, 20s age woman lady in a dress on a football field, purse on her shoulder, big sunglasses, high heeled shoes, aerating the field. In horror, she passed by me and grabbed the kid from the other team. Adrenaline pumping, she picked up the boy by the shoulder pads and told him that the hit was illegal and that he better not do it again. Mom, now you know why we never gave you any field level tickets over the last 17 years. My greatest cheerleader. I thank all my friends and family that have come here so far to be here today. You can't imagine how far it truly is from San Francisco. I'm blown away for how many of you here. I judge a man by the company that he keeps, then you guys are making me look really good. Thank you. There is no way to ever give each of you the proper credit, so forgive me for not naming everyone. But the impact that you've had in my life, suffice to say, without your friendship and counsel, I wouldn't have made it very far. During our lives, we face many forks in the road and decision points that influence the direction we go. I feel so fortunate to have had so many people in my life who have given me, have been great friends and teachers who have played a significant part in guiding my journey so far. Especially my family, my brother Mike and Tom and Jim and my sister Melissa, all Americans in their own right. I am so honored to join this class of the Hall of Fame. You are wondering why it is so special. I know you are. It's because we're all quarterbacks, of course. Dan, it's a privilege to share the stage with you today. To the Pollard family, I honor your heritage through Fritz, a pioneer, African-American, and quarterback. To the Friedman family, we honor the memory of Benny, a pioneer in his own right. Our hearts and prayers go out to another one of our comrades as well today, Jim Kelly and his wife, Jill, who lost their son, Hunter. Jim, we love you, and our thoughts are with you today. As my dad said, I'm not sure where a Hall of Fame career starts. I look back and he mentioned the six interceptions. He met, forgot to mention my JV year when I also threw six interceptions. Or is it the six touchdowns in Super Bowl 29 or the six passing titles? In between was a lot of failure and a lot of success. So I know the road to greatness is not a smooth path. Learning from our failures, all of us, is as important as learning from our successes. I did not learn all these things on my own. I have been the recipient of the best coaching that one person has collectively ever had over my 30-year football career. My, my dad mentioned Mike Renato at Greenwich High School, the hotbed of football. Then there's Lavelle Edwards, also a Hall of Famer himself. Mike Holmgren coached me fresh out of San Francisco State at BYU, and Ted Tolner, who was the great John Hadel and the Hall of Famer Sid Gilman, who convinced me to, turn, to let them tutor me in LA. Along with Don Klosterman, they made a great threesome and taught me more about pro ball and quarterbacking than I could get in a lifetime. Sid Gilman would tie my feet with a rope and taught me that playing quarterback was an art form. He'd always gravelly say, this is not a game, it's a canvas and you are Michelangelo. I love Sid, he convinced me not to listen to the many people who believed at the time in the mid 80s that you could not be a great quarterback if you could scramble. Go figure, times change. It never made much sense to me anyway. The coaching hit parade never subsided in my career. When I got to San Francisco, it was only my favorite college coach against my home run, future Super Bowl winner, and again, Bill Walsh, the man with the most impact in football over the last 25 years. The innovation and enlightenment that he brought to the game is now commonplace in the league. We know about the West Coast offense that half the league runs now in some form, as well as the other intangibles that he brought to the game, like limiting contact and practice to save legs and injuries. His influence is now all over the league, and I was grateful for the formative role he played in my progress. He believed in a scrambling lefty. Thanks, Bill. George Seifert pushed me very hard and never let me rest. The situation we were both in demanded no excuses. It was Super Bowl or bust in San Francisco. Tough place to live. 
I never thought I would like a defensive-minded head coach, but he and I were champions together. I have to say today in the audience, I've never been more productive as a player than in Mike Shanahan and when Gary Kubiak were my coach. Mike, thanks for coming today on your off day in training camp. That tells you a little something. He and I were equally, in equally intense, and he drove me beyond my own standards. He believed that I could be an MVP quarterback, one of the best game day play callers I have ever seen. His famous quote to me before Super Bowl 29, Steve, don't worry, we're going to crush these guys. Yeah, well, we did, and he knew. Steve Mariucci coached me to the end. His enthusiasm and vigor for winning was contagious. Both he and Marty Morningweg made me enjoy the game more than I'd ever had in the past. They helped me realize how much fun a game can be, even with all the expectations of Super Bowls. Mooch always yelled at me, is this fun or what? Yes, it was. Along with the teammates that have your back, as my dad mentioned, Lee Steinberg over the years, a sports lawyer ahead of his time. With Jeff Morad, they were the sports rep dream team. Joined by Dave Dunn, every negotiation I had, which there were many, I, they had done it like as if I had done it myself. I never felt awkward because they negotiated with an eye to what I would have done if I would have done it. What better representation can you have than the people who represent you, the person as well as the player? Football is a unique sport. There is no statistic, no touchdown or passing yard that is accomplished by a single person. The rarest of sports in that you cannot do it alone. Just think about the times you have achieved something on your own. How great was the celebration compared with when you achieved something when you were on a team? Whether in sports or in business or with your family, the celebration is so much richer and enjoyable when it is with other people. My favorite moment still was the five minutes after the Super Bowl when we were alone in the locker room, just the 50 players and coaches, kneeling in the Lord's Prayer, then looking up at each other and realizing that yes, we were world's champion. No media, no one, just us. That feeling when you do something great together is like, is like no other. No MVP or passing title can compare to that feeling. That is why football players talk about the camaraderie with a deep sense of passion and commitment. It is the sport that when one of your guys says, I've got your back, it is not figurative. You depend on them physically and emotionally. A Hall of Fame career is loaded with hundreds of best friends, guys that have your back. I am overwhelmed today to think about the great men that I knew in my 17 years as a pro that taught me about what it means to play as a team with your heart, might, mind, and strength. Men who shared my passion for working together to get it pushed across the line despite injury and fatigue. Many were my heroes while I played, with them and only more so now that I don't. This honor for me today is also an honor for all those that I played with. The season of an NFL player is fierce. Unlike baseball and basketball where you play lots of games, in football it's only 16. You can't afford to lose. The routine of training camp, the tricks we played on each other, the hang time with the boys, the gallons of sweat left on the practice field, the drama of who would be the starting players, the daily routine of tightening the cleats, smelling the newly cut grass, laboring through films, getting constant feedback are all things I will never forget. The anticipation of playing the Cowboys on Monday night, the rhythm of the three-step drop, the thrill of the two-minute drill, the memorization of all the plays and the op multiple options that Bill Walsh forced me to learn are lasting memories. Cinching up the shoulder pads and pulling up the socks, walking out into the tunnel and seeing a stadium full of red, the Blue Angels buzzing over the stadium like today, the Star Spangled Banner, all leave an indelible impression on my mind. I think we all love the game because it in some way is a microcosm of the lives in four short quarters over a three hour period. Filled with twists and turns, unexpected and thrilling, and can you leave you breathless and heartless in a flip of a coin? How exciting, makes me want to strap it on again. I can taste the pride that I felt to be able to put on a 49er jersey and represent the great city of San Francisco. We did not think we were going to win. We knew that there was no alternative. Eddie DeBartolo, as anyone who played for him knows, is one of the all-time greats. Playing for him was a pleasure. Eddie and Carmen Pauls, he took a huge chance with me. In essence, bet the farm, and we collectively delivered. How could you not love playing for Eddie? The rumors are true, he was the best. I'm also grateful for the friendships that I have developed with John and Denise DeBartolo York. They have been kind and supportive, especially during this Hall of Fame year. And also thanks to Jack Lambert, the surrogate father of all the DeBartolos and my right-hand man. 
The 49ers of that time will always be remembered for our successes. Anyone who followed our team will remember all of the great moments. I guess there will never be another period of time like that in sports franchise history. I love the faithful fans of San Francisco. I wanted to live up to your amazing expectations. You were the heart of it all. Thank you so very much, even for the booze that motivated me to work harder to gain your trust and confidence. No fans ever deserved it more. They were halcyon days never to be forgotten. In San Francisco, I found football in its newly enlightened form. Along with Eddie, Bill, and Carmen, there was Hall of Famer Ronnie Lott. Thanks, Ronnie, for coming out today. Roger Craig, John Taylor, Tom Rathman, Tim McDonald, John Frank, and of course, all the men who protected me, Harris Barton and Jesse Sapolo, Steve Wallace, Bart Oates, Derek Deese, and on and on. I had found heaven on earth for football. Think back to the 49ers of the late 80s and 90s. Think of all the names that rushed to your memory. How lucky was I to be in the middle of that? If I named all the great contributors in the San Francisco organization and players on the field, I would be here way too long in this heat. Just know that I was blessed to spend 13 years in football nirvana. A nirvana built by many 49er greats over the years. Some here tonight, Joe Perry and Leo Namalini, Dave Wilcox, Bob St. Clair, Jimmy Johnson, Hugh McElhaney, Y.A. Tittle, John Henry Johnson, all great 49ers and men that I've known over the years. When I first came to San Francisco, I soon realized that I was watching the Michelangelo that Sid Gilman had years ago prior spoken about. It was an art in action, and I was privileged to be holding the palette. Joe Montana was the greatest QB I'd ever seen. I was in awe. I was tempted many times by the opportunity to play for other teams, but I was drawn to the inevitable challenge to live up to the standard that I was witnessing. I knew that I was a decent player, and for some reason God blessed me with a big picture knowledge that if I was ever going to find out just how good I could get, I needed to stay in San Francisco and learn, even if it was brutally hard to do. I had the faith that the opportunity would create itself at the appropriate time. I was tough to live with during some of those years, but as I look back, I am thankful for the struggles and trials that I had and for the opportunities that were given to me. When the opportunity for me opened up, being a regular quarterback was no longer an option. I would have gotten booed out of candlesticks so fast that I had to rise to a new standard of performance that Joe set. I many times th thought about quitting as I heard boos during my sleepless nights, but I feared calling my dad. I knew what he would say. Endure to the end, Steve. When Joe left, thank heaven he left behind Jerry Rice. We teamed up for a record, we teamed up for a record 83 touchdowns. His work ethic is renowned, and after every catch in practice, he wouldn't stop until he reached the end zone. It might have been a 10-yard sprint or maybe 90. It didn't matter. Nothing or no one is a better example of why we were great than Jerry. I'm expecting him to join me here in the Hall of Fame sometime before 2020. And Brent Jones, maybe most importantly, my roommate of 10 plus years, he kept my spirits up and constantly convinced me that this quest for greatness, greatness was achievable. He endured my psychotic nature at times, listened to me, and was a great friend both in difficult and good times. He was an all-pro player, than an all-pro friend. Football is the only major sport that plays with a ball that is not round. And given that, there is destined to be some unique bounces. No career, no matter how great, is smooth all the way through. But one thing is for sure. If you are lucky enough to make it a career, you cannot play very long without a love of the game. The game demands too much of you physically, emotionally, and even spiritually to stay in it if you don't love it. I don't care what you, how much you get paid. You show me a six eight or 10 year veteran of the NFL, and I'll show you a man that loves the game by definition. Money isn't the key at the moment of impact. I have seen a lot of guys play for money in practice and warmups, but I have never seen one play for money at the point of contact. You cannot buy a football player on game day. He plays for the love of the game, and that is why it's impossible for money to ruin it. I love the game of football. I, it is an amazing sport that teaches kids and adults powerful lessons that can contribute to making us successful human beings. I love that so many people are drawn to the game you can see here today. It is no surprise to me, and I encourage others to get involved in the game, to allow your children to play as long as properly coached. Teamwork, accountability, dedication, trust, faith are a few lessons that my teammates and I have learned over 17 professional seasons.
I have thrown 107 interceptions in my career. Every time without fail, there is a moment when all your teammates look back at you and say, why'd you throw it to that guy? Either by their words out of their mouth or by the look on their face, the latter even hurt more. All the mitigating circumstances and excuses came rushing to my mind. The receiver turned the wrong way. The lineman missed the block. The ball was wet. It was tipped by a defensive player. And on and on, you can think of all the excuses. It was years before I learned the tough lesson that my teammates didn't respond to mitigating circumstances. Despite the fact that the excuses were true, they did not care. I thought that I'd lost them with the ducking of the original question. But why did you throw it to that guy? The bottom line was that I had messed it up. I learned to turn to my teammates and say, I messed up, it's on me. But we are going to go down and score next time down the field. What do you say? I know my teammates and friends can attest that I like my options and have a hard time deciding. But when you grow up having big linemen ask you tough questions about your decision-making skills, it has a lasting impact on you. Learning to be ultimately accountable for my throws has taught me an enduring lesson in life. You must own up to your mistakes and then more importantly, repent or fix the problem. I used to hold onto the ball despite the fact that my receiver was open because I couldn't see him. I'm a lot shorter than Dan. Many times the big lineman blocked my view. It was like Mike, Hol it was Mike Holmgren who yelled at me one game and said, Jerry's open, why didn't you throw it to him? I said, I couldn't see him. Well, you better start seeing him. Thanks for the tip. I'll be sure to start seeing what I can't see as soon as I can see it. But it made me pause. Maybe it would be good for my career if I just threw it where I thought my receiver was. I had just seen him a second ago. I knew where he was headed. Throw it. Simple. Go on faith and knowledge. You can believe that I have learned that, that lesson many times. Trust your instinct and let it fly. Think about it. There are 50 guys on a team with 50 different personalities, different races, religions, socioeconomic backgrounds, geographies, family histories, education, interests, trials, on and on. Most of the guys have very little in common but for their passion in football. Championship football cannot be played without a sense of love and respect for your teammates. When the game starts, all our differences become unimportant. There becomes a sole focus on a common goal, and you embrace and appreciate the unique gifts people bring. It is amazing to see players rise to the level of expectation and work together for a common goal. Football is the great metaphor for life. For me, it will never again be third and ten, late in the fourth quarter, down by four at Candlestick Park. Nothing in life can be like those great moments. But with those experiences then, and all the other good things that happened, life today is even better. With my wife Barb and my two sons, Braden and Jackson, I have found the secret to life, loving others more than yourself. I sincerely love my family and know that being a Hall of Fame husband and dad is what will eventually define my life. Thank you, Barb, for your sacrifices for our family. Thank you to the Hall of Fame and all the great men inside. I stand on your shoulders today and hope that we collectively inspire those playing today and on into the future to live to your legacy. I am honored to join your ranks today, and more importantly, I stand to honor those in my life who made it possible. Thank you very much.